Jesus, again we say thank you. Thank you for the forgiveness of sins. Thank you that we can come to you and ask you for that forgiveness. Thank you that you love us. Thank you that your love is unconditional. Thank you that you allow us to enter into your presence. Sit at your feet. Listen to you. Be loved by you. Be transformed by your grace. Father, as we start this new year, as we start this new year remembering your sacrifice and the victory of that cross, I pray that you will help us to draw near to you each day. And I pray that the truth of the cross and the resurrection will continue to change the way we do life here on earth. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. Well, guess what? I'm your, I'm your preacher today. It's been a while, I know. I've been a, uh, on maternity leave for a while. Um, if you're wondering where Eli is, well, he had a very busy New Year's, so he's in bed resting, as he should be. Let me just get my notes. So, what did you guys get up to in New Year's Eve? Who went out and partied? Anyone? Yes, yeah, some good confessions there. That's good, good on you. Who celebrated at the city? Anyone went to see the fireworks? Who went to some house parties? Yes, a few of you, awesome. Who stayed home and went to bed at 10 o'clock at night? I know. You know, this was a very hard thing for Simon and I because Simon and I love New Year's. Ever since Simon and I got together, we have been out every year for New Year's. But of course, we now have Eli. And um, Eli changed things for us. So uh, we watched, have watched the nine o'clock fireworks. I went to bed. My husband stayed up until midnight because he, had, he was on bottle duty, which means cleaning the bottles, sterilizing them, putting the formula, making the formula, putting it in the fridge. And, uh, and then he went to bed by himself at 12 o'clock. Happy New Year. Life has a lot of change, don't you agree? There's so much change that happens in life. Some of that change is great. In fact, we look for it. We pursue it. We go after it. Like marriage. Alan and Lisa getting married this year in March. Woohoo! That's good change. Alan had to pursue Elise. Alan had to ask Elise. Elise had to say yes. That is a welcome change. That is a change that they've sorted out, and that's awesome. Maybe for some of you, there might be the birth of a child. Dave, Hannah, second child now. Woohoo! Awesome news. There's some stuff there that will happen for that child to be conceived. They pursue that change in their life. Now, there's also the change of a new job or maybe a new suburb. Those are good changes, things that we look forward to. But what about change that is unexpected or unwelcomed? Like the death of a loved one, getting fired, health issues, an unexpected event that turns your world upside down. How do we respond to that change when it happens? Change happens all the time in life, and how we respond to it, I think, shows our character, it reveals our spiritual maturity. It allows us to see what we really value, what we really prioritize. It all comes out in the open for everyone to see. That's the funny thing about change. Um, people can tell how you're doing, how you're coping with it, by the way that you talk about it, by the way that you react towards it. I don't think that we will ever be able to respond to change perfectly. But I do believe that with God's help, if we allow him to help us, we can grow and walk the journey with a little bit more grace and courage and truth. And hopefully along the way, become a little bit more like Jesus. This morning, I want us to reflect on a passage, a very well-known passage, a very well-known parable, 
which is found in Luke 15, verses 1 to 7. Before we get to it, though, I want to give us a little bit of a background. This parable is the first of three consecutive parables in which Jesus shows the heart of God and the mission of Christ. In Luke 19, verse 10, the Bible makes it very clear what the mission of Christ was and continues to be through us, the church. For the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. This story that we're about to read challenges us the way that I guess we look at the heart of God, the way that we interact with the heart of God, and the way that it's meant to move us with compassion to seek the lost among us and to bring them the good news of God's hope. This parable also starts by reminding us that the Pharisees and the scribes were grumbling over the fact that Jesus receives sinners. Jesus contrasts that grumbling with the rejoicing that happens in heaven when one sinner repents and comes back to know God. Through this parable, we're going to meet and we're going to focus on how intense the heart of God is for the lost. And it's going to be a very, I guess, humbling experience for us to be reminded that God is not just interested in us, in our personal salvation, but he's interested in those among us who have either wandered off or don't know him yet. So please turn to Luke chapter 15, verses 1 to 7, as we hear from it right now. Thank you. Now the tax collectors and sinners were all gathering around to hear him. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered, This man welcomes sinners and eats with them. Then Jesus told them this parable. Suppose one of you has a hundred sheep and loses one of them. Does he not leave the ninety-nine in the open country and go after the lost sheep until he finds it? And what, and when he finds it, he joyfully puts it on his shoulder and goes home. Then he calls his friends and neighbours together and says, Rejoice with me, I have found my lost sheep. I tell you that in the same way there will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who do not need to repent. Okay, I want to ask you some questions. These are reflective questions. If you want to close your eyes in order for you to reflect, you go ahead and do that. I think it's always a good thing to start the new year with just, just some bit of silence, a bit of reflection, a little bit of pondering, and allowing God to speak. You don't have to answer this. Just think about it. First question. Who are the people that you will never, ever, ever consider talking to? Which person or groups of people will you not want to pass in the street? Who is so far gone that they don't deserve your attention anymore? Who are the lost in our community? Who are the lost in your family? Do you feel as if you are lost? I spent some time this week contemplating those questions and then later on having a chat with a group of people about these questions. And we came up with some answers. Now, I'm not going to ask you to share your answers because maybe for some of you, you're still kind of working through them. But I am going to share the answers that we had. 
I'm not proud of these answers, by the way, but they are very honest answers. And I think that, again, if we begin the year with truth, then change can happen. So who are the people that I personally will never, ever, ever consider talking to and that my group of friends will probably have a real hard time talking to? Bikies, prisoners, terrorists. Which are the people or the group of people that we will not want to pass in the street? Anyone who's doing drugs or dealing with them? Tre terrorists. There's a theme here, as you can see. Who is so far gone that they don't deserve our attention? Terrorists. Who are the lost in our community? People who have wandered away from God. Who are the lost in our families? Siblings, spouse, children. Do you feel as if you are lost? Yep, sometimes I have no idea where this journey is going and I feel incredibly lost. How about you? Let me ask you one more question. Do you think that the church knows how to respond to the lost in the same way that Jesus responded to the lost every single day of his ministry here on earth? Do we chase after them the same way that this shepherd did in the parable? Do we rejoice in the same way that the people did in this parable when they come back? You know, throughout this parable and the other two that follow, Jesus is strongly suggesting that we are meant to go out and seek the lost. Now, I don't know about you, but the message is always about the fact that Jesus came to save the lost, which is true. But he also came to seek them out. And we, the church, are called to do the seeking and proclaiming of salvation. We focus for many years on the proclaiming bit, but how many of us are actually seeking the lost out in our families? in our neighborhood, in our workplace. How many of us are actually being intentional about this? Because we know that what we have to offer will bring this person the completion, the joy, the abundant life that they're so much seeking and wanting. I'll be honest, I find it very difficult to seek out the lost. And you know why? Because I'm, I'm, I'm scared of the change that it's going to bring to my life. There'll be good change, of course, because I will see a transformation happen. And hey, amen to that. Who doesn't want to be part of a transformation? That's awesome. But I'm, also, but I'm actually quite concerned about the unwelcome change that it's going to bring into my life. Maybe I'll need to stay up until 3 o'clock in the morning talking to this person about Jesus. Maybe I'm going to have to open up my home and let this person in and stay maybe a week, two, three months with me. Maybe I'm going to have to, I don't know, go out to their house and spend time in their neighborhood. Maybe I'm going to have to listen to a very horrible testimony that is going to shake the foundation of my life and I'm not ready for that testimony just yet. So much unwelcome change that I guess it can be quite concerning and quite scary. And I think that maybe that's the reason why some of us don't seek out the lost at times. Because we don't want to be confronted with what might come our way. Because what might come our way might be an inconvenience to us. And we don't want our life to be inconvenience. We want it to be happy. Who wants a happy life? We all do, right? Yeah, thank you, Damien, for being so honest. I appreciate that. I, so do I. Um, I had to listen. Uh, uh, last year, I had a family member give us a little bit of a sermon, and the sermon was all about happy life. And as I sat there going, no, that's not what the gospel is about. But that's what he was saying. Have a happy life. Seek out a happy life. And that's the message that the world tells us. And let's be honest, that's the message that sometimes we seek out ourselves. We want to hear about happy moments and things going smoothly, we don't want to hear about the unwelcome change that will turn our world upside down. 
The Pharisees, believe it or not, had no problem whatsoever with what Jesus was saying to the sinners. They agreed they needed to repent and come back to God. You know what their problem was? His method. Because his method was like a mirror to them. And when they looked in that mirror, they saw that they were not doing the things the right way. They were busy in their little hub waiting for the lost to come to them so that they can tell them how sinful they were and how they needed to change, but they didn't do any change at all. Jesus, on the other hand, was with the prostitutes, with the tax collectors, mingling with them, going to their neighborhood, spending time with them, having to see, probably having to see a lot of things that, well, God knows everything, but still doesn't make it that he likes to have the stuff that he sees. Spending time in their environment, being inconvenient by all of this. The Pharisees didn't like that at all. Hence why they were just as lost as the prostitutes and the tax collectors. And I guess that's the danger that we also run into. If we don't connect with the heart of God, if we don't allow his ministry to be like a mirror that points us into the right direction, into the right path, we can become the Pharisees of this generation. And that's a scary thought, is it not? It's a scary thought. 20 years ago, a man called Tony Campolo, who knows Tony Campolo? Yeah, great evangelist, awesome guy. He wrote a book called The Kingdom of God is a Party. And in that book, he tells a testimony. And the testimony is this, that he was in a bar in a, in a, called The Greasy Spoon, and um, he overheard a prostitute talking about the fact that today was her birthday, but that she doesn't celebrate it, she's never celebrated it. In fact, she's never had a birthday party in her life. So Tony Campoli gets this idea, I'm going to throw this woman a birthday party. So at 3.30 in the morning, he organizes a birthday party for this prostitute at the Greasy Spoon. Probably the food was not that great, just the name of that says it all really. The people that came to the party, prostitutes, pimps. He organized a cake, he organized some food, and they sang her happy birthday and that woman broke down and she just... She was, I don't know, just she could not believe that someone, a stranger, had gone through all that travel to celebrate her birthday. I heard that testimony at a Hillsong conference. You know what hit me? 3.30 in the morning. I was sitting there going, 3.30 in the morning, seriously? Couldn't we have the party in the afternoon at a more convenient time? Couldn't we have the party maybe at a better place than the greasy spoon? That's what I was stuck in. I was going 3.30 in the morning. I get the fact that she had to know about the love of God and I get the sentiment behind it all, but 3.30 in the morning. That's an inconvenient time for me, God. I'm not sure that I want to do that for someone that I don't know. But isn't that what Jesus does every day for us? And isn't that what he did for all the people that he met? And isn't that what the church is all about? We're meant to get out of our comfort zone and seek them out and actually minister to them at a convenient time for them, at a convenient location for them, at, in their safe place, rather than in our safe place. Do you ever stop to think about the sacrifices that Jesus has made for us? And I'm not just talking about the cross, I'm talking about the fact that he chose to come to earth as a baby. He trusted earthly parents to bring him up until the appointed time. He got a job as a carpenter. He ate and drank and spent time with the lost, knowing full well what the consequences were. Do you ever stop to just think about those moments and think about how much he gave up for us? Not just the cross, not just the resurrection, but the life that he had here for 33 years. He is our saviour and he's definitely our friend. And he invites us to be part of a meal that is greater than we could ever imagine. 
But most importantly, he invites us to model his grace every day in our lives in whatever platform we might have. That is what he wants us to do. That is what he wants us to follow. And I wonder whether we are ready for this year, 2016, to get out of our comfort zone and do what he did and what he wants us to continue to do on his behalf. Welcome the inconveniences, as hard as they may be, as challenging as they may be. Look in the mirror and instead of running away from the truth, face it, knowing that God loves us, that he'll forgive us, that he'll give us the strength and the courage to walk through it, and that not only will the people that we reach out to will be transformed, but that we will be transformed also. One of my favorite movies that I think captures this very well it's called The Blind Side. Has anybody watched that movie, The Blind Side with Sandra Bullock? I love that film. It's a great story. It's the story about a young boy called Michael Aaron, Big Mike, who has been living in foster care for, well, since I think he was four, from one family to the next family. And every time he is placed in a home, he runs away because he wants to go and be with his mama, but his mama is a drug addict. So... You know, her life is not that great. And then one day, the father, he, the, uh, fa uh, his father's friend, um, enrolls him into a Christian school. And it's there that one of the teachers realizes that he's got some great talent for American football. And Big Mike becomes friend with a little year seven kid. And this little year, year seven kid has a mother, Leanne. Do you guys remember that character by Sandra Bullock? Wow, she was a force to reckon with, Leanne. A very proper woman, the, hair, the right hairstyle, the right clothes, amazing manicure. She just, you know, she was taking no prisoners. Like, she was just amazing, this woman. She had everything under control. You looked at her house and you could see that it was just very orderly. But Big Mike comes into her life and, well, he changes things all around. She sees him walking one day on the street. It's raining. She stops the car. Where are you going, Big Mike? To the gym. What are you going to do there, Big Mike? Sleep. No, you're not. You're coming home with me tonight. The next morning, Big Mike wakes up really early, trying to, you know, go out before the family wakes up. She wakes up. She says, what are you doing, Big Mike? I'm going home. Where, where's home, Big Mike? I don't know. Well, then you're not going. You're staying here for Thanksgiving. This woman welcomes this homeless kid that she's got no idea who he is, by the way into her home. It changes their life. It turns it upside down. The husband all along is going, do we really need to do all of this change? And she says, yes, we do. We have to do this change. In the end, she tries to adopt him. And when she tries to go and find out about him and his family and do the whole adoption papers, there is no record of Big Mike's mother. But that's not going to stop Leanne getting what she wants. So she goes and finds the mother of Big Mike. And she goes to her neighborhood, she enters her home, she sits down in this very dirty, and I can only imagine, smelly couch. And this mother, this drug addict, just bursts into tears. And for the first time ever, Leanne shuts up. And she just holds this mother's hand. And that's all they do. Why was that mother crying? I have no idea. The movie doesn't tell me why. Maybe she was crying because for the first time ever, someone actually came to visit her at home and treated her like a human being. Maybe she was crying because she got news that her son was alive and not dead. Maybe she was crying because she was thankful that her son had ended up in a Christian home with someone that actually loved and was able to provide for her son. What was Leanne thinking? I have no idea. But I'm glad that she shut up. And I'm glad that she went there because that boy's life was changed. Do you think that God might have someone in mind for you this year that he might want you to do something as crazy as that for? Do you think that we as a church might be called to do something that crazy for this community? You know, some Christians believe, and I'll end with this, that people are not really lost. They believe that everyone goes to heaven automatically. And there are other Christians who believe 
that if we just leave the lost alone, they'll make their own way home eventually. Let's not bother them, let's leave them alone, they'll make their own home eventually. However, if no one is lost, and if people always make their own, their own way home eventually, then I believe that the mission of Christ was a waste of time. The atonement of Christ is not needed. If everyone is saved and people eventually make their way home, then why on earth did Jesus die on that cross? And yet in Luke 19 verse 10, the Bible very makes it very clear, the Son of Man came to seek and save the lost. He didn't simply say that he came to save the lost, he came to seek them out. And that is our calling for everyone who believes in Jesus Christ. You might have family members that don't know Jesus, who have wandered away. Well, that is your calling, to let them know about Jesus. How you do that, I don't know. You've got to work that out with Jesus. But that is your platform. Maybe you've got people in your neighborhood that don't know Jesus. Well, then that is your platform. Maybe you've got colleagues at work that don't know Jesus. Well, that is your platform. You can run away from it, or you can ask God to help you be the light that he has called every single one of us here to be. I wonder if 2016 we can start as a church to seek the lost out. And as Pastor Matt reminded us last year, instead of rejoicing every single time people come in, let's rejoice every single time we go out into their neighborhood, into their safe zone, and actually be with them there rather than just counting the numbers that walk through that door. Let's pray. Father God, and let's be honest with you, um, your word is very hard sometimes. It's hard because it really challenges our comfort zone. It challenges the way that we do want to live a happy life and a life that doesn't have too many inconveniences. We can manage a few, but please don't give us too many. It's usually the prayer that we might pray in silence or late at night. But Father, your gospel is the gospel of inconvenience. It is the gospel that pushes us out of our comfort zone. It is a, it's the gospel that challenges our character, our heart. And we can't deny that. So Father, let us start this year by saying, help us, help us to be the people that you want us to be. We acknowledge that we cannot seek out the lost by our own strength. We need your help to do this. We need you to guide us. We need you to give us courage and strength and wisdom. But most importantly, we ask that you give us love. We want to th say thank you in advance for all the amazing opportunities that you're going to give us this year to let people know about your love. We want to say thank you in advance for the lives that will be transformed this year, for the healing and the breakthrough that many people, not just us here, but in our community, in our families, will experience this year. We want to say thank you in advance. Help us, God, to be the people that you want us to be. In Jesus' name, amen. Savior alone, carry.